chapter 14, entitled The Forest of Enjoyment, text 24. Sometimes one can have a unique perspective of things if you're not involved, <coughs> if you can see it from a neutral perspective. He was living in the forest. At least keep a bowl so in your bag you have something to collect. For him, even a bowl was unnecessary opulence. He would go to the house of somebody who was in the morning and they were milking their cow, and he would just and they would get their own bowl, <coughs> milk the cow. Out of the cow, so the day goes on with a drink, and you get the ball back and leave. Since he wouldn't even stay in one place longer than it took to milk the cow. Always one. <clears throat> Other people, and even though they may not um, own anything, you know, official property in their name, possessions, but they become attached to a certain situation here, you're there for a long time. So like it may be a tree in the forest, nobody owns it, but I'm living under the tree. This is my tree. And Shukadeva was following, he never slept under the same tree twice. As long as we live. From one place to another. He couldn't call anything his country, he couldn't call this is my forest, because he was in a different forest all. And he did this very purposely. You read when he, when he was in the womb of his mother, he had realized Brahma. He had realized the all pervading impersonal aspect of the Supreme Lord. He himself realized. And he understood all the dualities of this world and how they handle people in so many ways. So he decided, I'm just going to stay here. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see those attractions that just cause suffering. The angel tells, <laughs>
can't eat anything, see anything. Probably doesn't smell very good in there. <laughs> Life in the womb. This is I just, until I die naturally, I'm just going to stay here. And you can't move. Sometimes if you're on an airplane with seatbelt and economy class, you just <laughs> <laughs> came out of the room to hear more about Krishna. And then his whole conception was different. He didn't just see everything in the world as an illusion that um, distracts him. He saw everything in the world as Krishna's energy. But he was just observing it and didn't want to be, he didn't want to be trapped by the tendency to think that this is mine. He wanted to keep fully the consciousness that everything is fresh. He's the proprietor, and he's the enjoyer. So he was just wandering around. And not only from a physical perspective, he did he have absolutely nothing <coughs> to the extreme degree. He understood that there's subtle baggage <coughs> that can completely distract your attention. And that was becoming famous. Because there are six opulences that Krishna possesses in full <coughs> to an unlimited degree forever. And those opulences are the same very opulences that people love to have in this world. Because if you have any one of these opulences to a larger degree than others, then you become attractive. People become attractive if they're beautiful, if they have wealth, if they have strength. people get mixed up. Because I was just in London. And before I went to London, everybody who beat me while I was in the United States, everybody who heard I was going to London, they were saying, oh, this is a bad time. It's so crowded. There's so much traffic. There's so many people. It's going to be really terrible there. So I was thinking, you know, Shukri Dev Goswami doesn't care about that stuff. <laughs> some service there, some whatever traffic and everything, I'll go. So I went to do my service, and I was thinking there's going to be congestions everywhere, there were people everywhere. And you know something? I was there right at the heart of the Olympics. Even in the opening ceremonies in London, I never saw London so peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because of transcendental vision. It's not because there's hardly anyone around. It was incredible. We could drive around. There's always massive traffic in London, except now. <laughs> the reason is they made so much propaganda to keep people away because they, th they were thinking it was going to be masses of floods of people. And it was going to be traffic jams that were going to 
that were intolerable. So this propaganda that the British government was putting out, you know, don't come unless you really you know, have a purpose, because you're going to really be inconvenienced. And because of the propaganda, nobody came. <laughs> Everybody was afraid to come because it would be too crowded. And all the people who were in the Olympics, they were afraid to come to downtown London because they were, they were in East London, because it was going to be too crowded in downtown. So everybody in the Olympus stayed in the East, and nobody else came, and the taxi drivers were like really, really disturbed because no one was taking taxis, because no one was around. And all the shopkeepers were very, very outraged because no one was shopping. And they bought extra because they, you know, they were preparing massive crowds of people everywhere. And swamis like me were driving to our program. <laughs> they, even, they even had on every road practically, they, they reserved a particular lane all over the city with these five circles. And that lane is reserved for the athletes press for the Olympics. And anybody, and you have to have a car that has all these Olympics um, decorations on it. And if you're caught on that lane without an Olympic car, then you're going to get arrested. I don't know what to say because the traffic and all the, all the, the whole lanes are reserved for it's going to be miserable. Some of the places I was going, there were more cars in the Olympic lanes than on the athletes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only an athlete or two. Well, you know, they, they wanted to try to solve one problem, but in the problem of trying to solve one problem, they created a bigger problem. But the other is, that's not for lot. Solutions sometimes cause bigger problems than others. So Shukadeva Goswami, he's just saying everything is Krishna's property. And these six opulences we're talking about make a person attractive. And this is how powerful life is at every step. Because Krishna tells in Gita, Daivi Dusha Guna Mani Mama Maya Duratya. Mama Maya Duratya means Maya. This external energy comprised of the three modes of nature is my energy. So Maya, Maya Vyakshena Prakriti Sumite Sachanacha. This material energy is working under my control. So Maya is Krishna's energy. That means she is all powerful. She's super intelligent. She knows everything. So the Paramatma knows everything about you. Maya knows everything about you. Yes. She has such intelligence. What do you call it? Intelligence agency. If you, if you want to defeat somebody, the more you know about them, the more you know their strengths, their weaknesses. So Maya knows Those who are on this path are 
resolute in purpose, and their aim is one. They are not irresolute. devotees. What we know how to do good, she'll use that to defeat us. That's how comprehensive that they're all right. So when we understand that, we have a healthy fear of life. And we understand Mama Lala the Bhakti. That Krishna is the controller of Maya. If we surrender to Krishna, that beautiful verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Samasi, Kinyani, 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 that Maya is like an ocean. And all the illusions are like the waves of the ocean. And how many waves are in the ocean? And the waves of the ocean are always changing and adjusting and readjusting according to the environment. And very, but this is a different kind. Except the shore is not just 2,000 miles, <laughs> which is impossible. There is no shore. It's just ocean forever. Huh? As the Bhagavatam explains, if you take shelter of Murari or Krishna, then that vast ocean of water becomes reduced to the amount of water contained in a hoof print of a cat. So you have some nice little caps here. Now even a cow footprint. Sometimes you see cow footprints. It's only about this big. And a cat is only about this big. There, that those who are trying to cross the ocean of material existence by their own wealth, by their own intelligence, by their own strength, by their own beauty, by their own efforts, are 
like people who are trying to cross the ocean on a boat made out of solid rock. <laughs> well, now some people, they, they, they carve, they get the best designers, you know, Michelangelo, Raphael, and all these people carving the rocks, <laughs> carving the rock, the stone boat. So it looks very nice. It may be worth a billion dollars to carve <coughs> the type of stone. But it really doesn't make that much difference, right? Whether it's just simple rock or hand carved, mm -hmm. or pure marble. That is Italy. It's insane. But it describes those who take shelter of Krishna. Do you know how they cross the ocean? The lotus feet of the Lord are like a roach. And you just walk across the floor. Here's the ocean of material existence. You just go on this little boat of Krishna's lotus feet that you take shelter of, and you walk across the boat and you're on the other side. And the boat doesn't move, it just stays where it is. And you call other people. And everybody who follows you can just walk across the boat and they're on the other side. It's spiritual. How is it that the boat works that way? Because by Krishna's grace, when we take shelter of him, the ocean reduces <coughs> to an insignificant quantity. So Shukadeva Goswami, he has a very objective perspective of how people are living in the fever of trying to get ahead of this material world, trying to find <coughs> security, and trying to find relief from, from all the expectations and demands and everything else. <coughs> but Maya is so thorough that if you understand all those things, and you become detached. Oh, this person likes to be detached. I got it. <laughs> I got it now. <laughs> she goes right into your heart. And she gets you attached to being detached. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the opulence is renunciation. Six primary happenings is renunciation. Give up your attachment to both and strength and beauty and all these things, but then you become attached to your renunciation. And ego, it feeds your ego. You're thinking, I eat less than you. <laughs> get up early in the morning. I have less saris than her. I wear jewelry. My bed is harder than you. <laughs> Some fish who have the hook right down into their heart, pulling them. They're just like, you know, the fisherman kind of just lets the, the string get a little, they release some, so there's more room. So the fish is swimming around there. You can see, just see how free I am. Come on, 
Goswami, he understood that even prestige, recognition for being renounced is just as much <coughs> a distraction and for some of bondage as being attached to things. Being, a, being proud of one's detachment is another type of attachment. So Sukadeva goes from the head there. And all the, the common people were following him around and harassing him. Then he comes to the place where Narada Muni and Parvat Muni and Vishwamitra Muni and Gautam Rishi and all these great sages, Akshay Muni, they're all assembled. The greatest saints, sages, rishis, and yogis and the whole universe are gathered together to be Vishwamitra Goswami. And they're all deciding. Who should be the one who speaks? For seven days, you know, sometimes in this guy, you want to give everyone the chance to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's getting their chance, but the poor people are thinking, God, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Get everybody a chance to speak. There's 20 people in the audience speaking, and they're all going overtime. Four people in the audience is like, you know, where's Prasad? <laughs> 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 and 
that everybody's speaking on something else. It's hard to focus. <coughs> of course it's nice, but still. In this situation, they were all there. And they all had amazing things to speak, but they were trying to just have one person to focus, speak, and give a comprehensive talk. Who? And here, Shukadev was walking through the forest. <laughs> Laughing at him, but he's not saying he's not saying I am the son of Yas. He's just looking like him. He was happy. You see, when he was getting infamy and dishonor, he was thinking, this is opulence. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing but Krishna in this situation. It's not attractive. It's not attractive in these things. So when things that are not attractive to us happen. We can take shelter of what's attractive, Krishna. Otherwise, if things attractive happen to us, our tendency is to take shelter of that. And then we don't think Krishna. But I never really had that experience. <coughs> Sorry if I'm getting too psychological today. <laughs> but this, this chapter is very psychological, actually. So here's all these people chasing after him and making ridiculing him, and they think he's just a fool. And human nature is you like to harass people who are less than you. You like to see people less than you so you can think you're great. And then they came into this assembly of the greatest Rishi sages in the whole universe, and the king of the world, the emperor, sitting there. And they all stood up to receive Shukadeva's honor. They all honored him. And people were chasing after him. <coughs> God, you know, he's, he's no fun anymore. Let's get out of here. <laughs> they, they left. And they sat Shukadeva's Swami on Vyasa's on. And his father, Vyasa was there. The compiler of the death of the Vedic literature. And Narada Muni, his guru, was there. And all these sages, <coughs> Shishta Muni, the Guru of Ramachandra, and they're all sitting, sitting at the feet of Shukadeva Goswami, who was only 16 years old at the time. He came out of the womb of his mother when he was about 12, and he was just traveling around like a madman for four years, and now here he is, giving the most famous lecture of the history of the world. <coughs> Sukadeva Goswami is explaining the, material, the nature of the material world from a very, very neutral perspective. It's just seeing everything from within and without. And here he's describing how in the forest of enjoyment, people steal, and then other people steal from them, and then other people steal from them. And Srila Prabhupada likes to quote Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. Really, just had, I guess, what they would call in modern times cutting edge analogies, just explaining what's happening. <coughs> and Sheila Prabhupada quotes that a gang of thieves, they go, they break into somebody's house beat them, they steal everything from the house, then they go back to the forest hideout, and one of the thieves said to the other thieves, let us divide this up honestly. <laughs> honesty among thieves. So they have their own culture of honesty. And they'll punish each other. And somebody gets you know, more than another. We have to do this very honestly. But the problem is, you know, what they're trying to honestly organize and manage has all been gotten dishonest. Honor among thieves. So from Sukadeva Goswami's perspective, she says in Gita Sarva Bhokamesh, 
that everything's the path of the Bhagavan, of the Supreme Lord. And if we claim anything to be our own, we're a thief. And we're making all kinds of laws and we're creating all kinds of cultures to be honest in how we deal with it. <coughs> but we've stolen and then somebody steals from us. That's the way the world goes. Jiva, Jiva, Sajiva. The strong exploit the weak. So if we have the power, we'll take from somebody else and then somebody who's stronger than us is going to try to take it from us, and then something stronger than them is going to try to take it from them. And in this way, what's really steady? And ultimately, death takes everything away. Doesn't leave you with a single hero. You may work hard, or we may work hard in our life to get a big property. Because property is a stable and money in the stock market or the bank, you don't know what's going to happen to money. That property is stable. So you get a big property, 10,000 acres of private real estate. It's in your name. There's no mortgage. There's no contracts. It is completely legally yours. That's a great accomplishment. <coughs> but then when you die, you cannot take a single blade of grass with you. <coughs> Cannot take a single grain of dirt with you. It's a lot of dollars. Proprietorship means control. If you were part of the time, give us an example. It's like the honeybee. There's so many bees. These little bees, they really work hard. In America, when I was young, there was a saying, you should work like a bee. <laughs> you shouldn't stay like a bee, but you should work like a bee. Because bees are really not really hard. Here saying that Lakshmi's name is Chanchala, which means she's always moving. 
Never stays in one place. But there is one place she never leaves. The loving service of Narayana. So if we just understand that Lakshmi is happy with Narayana. And we can have so much property, we can have so much beauty, we can have so much opulences, whether it's a beauty or a knowledge or a strength or a fame or a renunciation or a wealth, whatever it may be. If we just use it in the service of the Lord without this false ego of wanting to be the proprietor, the controller, the enjoyer, then we can be liberated, even with all the stuff. <coughs> when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling in South India, he came to the house of the poor Mabana. In a place called Kurvachetra. <coughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he, he was a Swamiji. All he had was, Nityananda already threw his dungeon in the river, so all he had was his water pot and an extra set of clothes. And he had Kala Krishna carrying that for him, and he was intoxicated with the holy name, living such a simple life, just traveling, walking barefoot thousands of miles. And he came to Kurma Chetra, and there's a famous Kurma temple. How many have been to Kurma Very special, very holy place. And Ramanuja Sampradaya is very, very special pilgrimage site. And there's a temple of Kulkandra, very ancient. The way I knew was that there's just little villages around. He started dancing in front of the form of Kurmade, Krishna. <coughs> and soon the word spread that this beautiful sannyasi with golden. Weeping and standing, chanting, dancing. Soon, <coughs> hundreds of people were there to watch him. And soon, thousands, entire villages were coming to see this form of Mahaprabhu. And he was in such compassion, his love of Krishna was pouring out of his heart through his tears, through his voice, through his every gesture of his body. Bhakti dancing is not just like trying to attract people to our bodies. Dancing is not just a way of enjoying movement. In bhakti, every movement of our body during the dancing is an offering of our sincere desire to love and to please Krishna. Dancing was not only for the pure pleasure of Radha Krishna, but mm -hmm. in the mood of Radha, for the complexion of Radha, dancing for the pleasure of Krishna. But his dancing was to attract the whole world to, to dance for Krishna, to experience that. 